Welcome or welcome back. This is Pairs Well with Knitting. I'm Jennifer and this is a knitting podcast all about knitting, yarn adventures, and travel. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thrilled that you're here and that we get to spend some time together. Today's episode is featuring how to choose the perfect knitting pattern. This is basically a step-by-step guide on how to choose a knitting pattern to pair perfectly with your yarn to enjoy or further enjoy the knitting process and experience and to really enjoy what you are putting on our bodies in the end as the finished object. Get comfy, let's get into it. First of all, what I'm wearing, of course, is a folly knit. Today, I've got the filled sweater by Camilla Vad on. It's a stunning design that I believe came out last year. Yes, um, with a gorgeous textured yoke that resemble what she calls the grains. I have a whole episode that features this specific sweater. It is very special to me because it was knit up well in one of the adventures that the love of my life and I took uh, down east through Rhinebeck, Nova Scotia, all these things out in the east. It was just beautiful. Um, the sweater design in general is a really simple rounded yoke, top down. However, the grains are quite involved. I did mention that you do have to pay attention to every row. The yarn I will share quickly is a stunner of a yarn. This I picked up from the time that I had at Harrisville Design Mills. It was spectacular. This yarn is sheer by Harrisville Designs in the colorway Buttermilk, a natural, natural um, worsted spun. So super, no, not worsted, woolen spun, sorry. Super light, airy, cozy, it's a stunner. So if you are interested to find out even more details, click in in time back, you'll see the thumbnail with me in this sweater talking all about it. We are gonna move on into the step-by-step -step guide of how to choose the perfect knitting pattern. Let's bounce in. I have my little notes in front of me and we'll get chatting as we do. Selecting the pattern, I believe, when constructing a garment or an accessory is essential, of course, with a pairing of yarn. Now, if you've been here for a bit, you have seen the trials and tribulations that I have gone through in the past of knitting where gauges and always met. I won't bore you with all those details. Basically where I am now is I've really determined and refined my making process, mostly garments, some accessories, where I'm being ever more mindful of choosing a proper and sometimes absolutely perfect pattern to pair with yarn. When we choose or select a pattern that goes well with the yarn, where we are featuring all these other pieces of criteria that I'm gonna talk about, that joy of the experience can be ever more because it just makes our lives that much better and doing something that we love already this knitting time that we have can be even more delightful coupled with the fact that i mentioned that you are getting a knitwear piece be it accessory garment a gift for you, for someone else you love or for yourself where you are able to put this into your wardrobe and have it a beautiful pride piece that you are able to wear and style from items that you already own. Let's do this. First of all, I want to start with my process of how I even get dreaming about knitting. I think about knitting probably, I think for most people outside of knitting community, they would say it's way too much. I think it's just the right amount because I love knitting so much. I love thinking about it. I love planning it. I love getting inspired. And this is where this journey starts out for me. And this is where the guide is gonna start for us, is the inspiration. I love 
looking at knitting pieces. This can be absolutely in person if we are lucky enough, of course, to be in a community of knitters that we see around us where we're able to ask questions, touch feel sweaters, get really excited about a design or construction. Alternatively, and this is I think a lot of us can share in this experience, is online inspiration. For myself, obviously, is through YouTube with other podcasters that are excited and sharing about what is on their needles or their bodies, as well as other visual platforms like Instagram. This is something that I feel I just love that idea of dreaming, limitless possibilities of designs and modifications with the yarn of your choice. It is just, it's, I think it's one of my very favorite parts of knitting. I mean, they're all my favorite part, but this is just, I think this is, this is what drives us into knitting, where we're getting motivated and excited to take that initiative to cast on. We need to consider other pieces of criteria when choosing a pattern. So even if we're seeing something on someone else's body or online where we're thinking this is the perfect pattern or perfect sweater. Perhaps you have that lovely yarn that you want to pair it with. We also want to consider other pieces. I think skill level is essential to talk about here. Now, we do know that there is a vast array, a whole rainbow of skilled knitters at all different levels, which is lovely. What designers I feel have started maybe stepping away from, but some still do, which is totally cool, is they level their knitting pattern into say beginner, intermediate, advanced, that kind of thing. Nothing wrong with that because I think that communicates to us as a potential knitter of the pattern, how focused are we going to have to be? How minds on are we going to have to be or and just to give it kind of, I think, a classification to understand what we would be getting into. This is, I think this goes without saying, but I will say, no matter what level we believe we're on, there is no assessment, there's no evaluation telling us and classifying us into these silos of advanced knitter, intermediate knitter, beginner knitter, we're, you know, we're doing our own thing. I think we have to look at these skill levels as what are we willing to do? What are we willing to put on our needles? How much patience and time do we have to knit this project? What I'm saying, if you are an absolutely beginner knitter, you probably need to know some of the basics, knit, purl, increases, that kind of thing before you start branching out into these, you know, high advanced knits, if you will, maybe cables, maybe feral knitting, maybe intarsia, but know that if you are super jazzed to try and create these beautiful knitting masterpieces, you can probably do it. It's just gonna take more time, more brain space, absolutely more patience because there will be a likelihood that you will be ripping back your work and having to recreate it. If you're an advanced knitter, you've been knitting for the vast majority of your life, amazing. It doesn't mean obviously that we need to only knit really advanced knits. We Knitter's choice, we're the boss of our knitting, you choose as you wish. You might wanna have what people are calling a palette cleanser knit, where you are literally knitting a tube of stock net in the round to create something. Wonderful. I This is where I see such a limitless possibility, but knowing that we, I think we have to be mindful of this piece of criteria, of the skill and skills and techniques that we already know and seeing how willing we are to increase that platform of our skills and techniques. If we're not fully ready to invest that time or brain space, amazing, that's fine. We'll just stick with the things that we know. So I think the consideration of skill 
is a massive piece of choosing a pattern in this puzzle. Next is exploring different pattern sources. Now, I do feel this is more limited in this way. So when we, I think I'll speak on my behalf, when I often think of where I can find a pattern, I immediately, after I get my inspiration from often Instagram, YouTube, whatever it may be, maybe it's a, it's a ready-made sweater that I'm inspired by to try to mimic or find a pattern of, then I look into Ravelry. That is my go-to, it may not be yours. You're probably familiar if you are a knitter. It is a really, I would say, inclusive site that many designers do use to sell their patterns on. The beautiful thing, as you know, is that it's not only the patterns that are for purchase there, there's also free ones, and there are so many more details within that page of the pattern per se, then you can find anywhere else as a knitter. For example, if you're a sewer, there's nothing similar that compares to the Ravelry site for sewing because people can put as detailed notes as they wish, which is so helpful for a knitting community with what have they what have worked really well with the pattern and what didn't. So Ravelry obviously is a great platform. A lot of designers as well have their own private business websites that you can purchase from if you're not comfortable using Ravelry. And another source that I don't often consider, actually there's two, is pattern books. I own pattern books. I often find knitting pattern books available, even people are giving away, which is lovely. And I can take inspiration from those. I can knit up patterns from those, but I find they get put in the bookshelf and then I kind of forget about them at times until I start to go back, flip through, get inspiration again. And so we, I think being mindful of the patterns that we already own, especially, and I mean, I could go on, when designers have their sales, annual or semi-annual sales, some knitters love to purchase, as they should, patterns on sale, great, why not? Still supporting the designer, but you get a little bit of a bargain, a little bang for your buck. I find often, and I'm speaking from personal experience, we get really jazzed about that one pattern. It goes into our library and then it kind of sits there. And then we don't, I feel there are times that we don't always knit it. So looking back in your library to see what you already own, it's a nice option. Pattern sources. The next piece of criteria that I wanna talk about when choosing that beautiful, perfect pattern is the consideration of design elements. This is probably pairs with so many other things that we just talked about with the inspiration, with the skills and techniques, but really thinking about what are the features of that knitwear, the accessory, the garment that we would be excited to knit. Maybe it's a new thing that we're exploring, a new way of construction of, say, the sweater. Is it top up, top down? Are there different elements like texture, like interesting different stitches? Maybe it's lace work, cabling. Um, it could be such a variety of things. So being mindful of this as well, as we're going in to choose our pattern can be really helpful. The next piece of criteria, which I did touch on because again, these all kind of bleed into each other. Um, they're not necessarily just chunked out with, you know, with boxes is your time and commitment to the project. I like to believe as a knitter who really enjoys what I do, I'm not getting paid for this. This is something that I love doing because it brings me great joy. I love the whole knitting process. I love sharing about my knitting. It is something that I do this on my free time. You might be the same way. And so I think deciding really and planning and organizing what we're gonna put on our needles but also knowing, hopefully, that there probably, hopefully, is not a time limitation or 
a, a certain restraint. In the event, for example, test knitting or gift knitting, that kind of thing, there might be that piece where you really need to consider timing for your knit. Is this something that you can take on and you know bring into your personal life during your free time? And also the commitment. Is this something that is going to feel more like a job and that you have to do, or is it gonna be more pleasurable? I have to say, as someone with the personality I have, which sounds like a lot of other knitters that I do follow on the YouTube platform, is that we love starting a project. Part of the joy after dreaming up this magical creation in our minds and really visualizing what is going to be popping out of our needles, having that knit item get started and you're casting on, there's nothing better. It is to me like the first glass of wine. It is the most beautiful little few sips in the beginning and it's so joyous. It just brings all, all the pleasure to the pleasure senses. Sometimes as we go, things can get a little more boring, more, you know, less exciting, less jazzy. I mean, you know the sweater, you finish the yoke, all the fun of the lace, the texture, the pharaoh bits, that might be over. And now you're doing stocking down the round. I'm a huge stock neck girl of the round fan, so don't get me wrong. However, the mojo for one item, especially for monogamous knitters, can really decrease, I think, over time. So I think allowing ourselves that grace, I know a lot of knitters have many projects on the needles. That gives us that versatility to kind of dabble in a variety of different projects so that we don't get bored of the one thing. And again, we are doing this for fun. We're doing this during our free time. We should enjoy it. We want to enjoy it, so let's enjoy it. Let's look at swatching. This is a really big deal. Um, gauge swatching, of course, is an essential piece of knitting and pairing a pattern with yarn. If you had have asked me last year in 2023, I would say you're bananas and I can do as I wish because I like to take control of my knitting. I'm the boss of my knitting. However, after many, many times of casting on with the yarn that I envisioned for this project, which is beautiful, would involve me ripping back a lot perhaps frogging the entire project, perhaps recalculating the entire project. These were things I was willing to do. These are things that I am not as willing to do any longer because I just want to focus on the joy of knitting instead of the joy of recalculating. So it is essential, I would say, to gate swatch for most projects. Again, there are a few that I feel you don't need to gauge swatch, and I'm going to tell you examples would be like a shawl, perhaps a scarf, because the sizes are not 100% essential that they fit your body to a T, your wrapping, but you do need to be mindful of meterage or yardage as you go. Another option, I think, for gauge and where it may be less important are things like blankets. Again, it doesn't fit our body. So is it totally critical that you gauge swatch? Probably not, even following a pattern. One of the projects that I can think of very specifically is the Musselboro hat by Yosolda. It is a top-down hat where pretty much the beginning of the hat, because of the increases that are made at the crest, or the crown of the head basically act as your great swatch so you can knit through the hat following the recommendations of the pattern. Other than that, we do have to take time to gauge swatch. So basically, if you're not gauge swatching and you're creating, for instance, a garment or an accessory with a pattern, you may not be hitting gauge. You may be getting a thing, a piece of knitwear that is going to be 
way too big or way too small and does not meet the dimensions that the designer has put out on that pattern piece. I hope that makes sense. I feel like it's pretty, it's pretty logical. When we're gate swatching, we need to talk about how to create an effective gate swatch. I think many of us are so jazzed to just cast on, nothing wrong with that, but taking literally, you know, a little bit of your evening, taking a break from maybe your main knitting project and chucking on the new yarn, the dream yarn that you're really imagining maybe this pattern in, or maybe it's a new dream yarn that you have acquired that has joined your stash and you're thinking, hmm, I wonder what kind of gauge I could get with this with different needles. Give it a go and make a nice little gorgeous square. You can go stock net. If your project has different stitches within it, lace, uh, color work, texture, go for and follow the instructions of the gauge itself within the pattern. Designers are brilliant. They really are methodical people where they recommend you do the gauge swatch in whatever specific pattern motif so that you get a better understanding and a real measurement that would hopefully mimic your true knitting of the actual project. Again, this is so the size is the size of the designer's intent. What I would also say is, which I do not do, but I have heard many times, is to knit the gauge swatch on the needles or the needle types that you would use to knit the project. For example, if you're knitting flat, go for a flat needle, go old school. If you are going to be knitting in the round, use your cable needles. And there's a lot of different videos and techniques that you can do to follow that kind of swatching. Make sure that you're knitting a swatch that is big enough so that you can get a true read of measurement, not a couple of rows. That's not going to give you an accurate reading. We can talk about now gauge and difference in gauge from the pattern. This can happen. And so that means that we are all knitting at different gauges at points and times with a variety of different knitting needles and perhaps all in the same yarn. So if we have a room of say five knitters, we all have the same yarn, we may get gauge on five different sizes of needles. It's really possible. So when there is a designer that is knitting in a specific needle size to get a specific gauge, it can mean that all these five people that have purchased a pattern might have to use a different needle size to obtain that gauge. This is why we gauge swatch. So we have that option to go up or down needle size to match the gauge of the recommended um, gauge size, the swatch size of the designer. We also, and to adjust for gauge differences, you've got some other options other than just changing needle sizes. That's a definite option, but we all have to look at to the fabric that it's creating are we liking the fabric? Is it too loose and too airy? Um, is it too tight? Is it going to be hard to knit on our hands because the stitches are so tight and the needle isn't big enough for that yarn? So with that as an issue, you can always look at the pattern and if the sizes are available up or down, you can adjust and choose a different size that you normally wouldn't. So you always have that option as well of changing the size to meet kind of that difference in percentage of gauge swatching. I'll give you a quick example. Let's say I gauge swatched and this always happens, my gauge is too big. It's bigger than in the recommended pattern. I can go down needle sizes, but sometimes and oftentimes I have already gone down two, sometimes three needle sizes. So then what I have to do is I have to go down a, a size of the pattern. Oftentimes in my case, I'm already knitting at the size one, the smallest size. That's why I have to recalculate if I want to stay keeping or hold this pattern with the yarn because I have that vision. So that's a lot of math and that's a lot of recalculation. 
The other option is that you go with a different pattern. You go with a pattern that is going to work with the gauge that you're getting with those needles and that yarn. Sometimes it's worth calculating everything. Sometimes it's absolutely not. You get to decide as the knitter. Let's talk about now reviewing our pattern options. So analyzing the pattern instructions is I think another component of criteria that we should be mindful of when selecting a pattern. To me, this isn't a massive deal breaker because different designers, of course, construct and write their patterns in different ways. The wording can be different. We can even follow patterns that are in a different language than we are used to with all the translating apps out there. Um, but I think what we can be mindful of is again, the time constraints that we may or may not have and patience. For example, if you want something that is going to be really easy to ride through and knit for pleasure, really have kind of a mind off knit, I would go with a pattern designer that you know of and have knit and enjoyed the process of. Something that's clearly written, really concise with instructions. You can go super hand-holding if that's what you're into. If you are willing to have more time and patience, go with a newer designer to you that you don't know and haven't followed before. That's an option. I think also in analyzing the pattern instructions, be mindful of the patterns being written in word and sentences and then charted as well. I'm someone that I adore charts and actually if I could get somehow magically all knitting patterns just in a chart, I'm very much that person that that is my jam. I love looking at charts. I find them really easy to follow and I'm doing a lot less reading or scanning if you will in order to replicate what the pattern is sharing with me. So having little symbols is a real quick and dirty for me to pull out what I need to do, which is more enjoyable for me. Um, when patterns are written in words, in rows with full sentences, I find A, that can be really daunting overall because the pattern pages are so much more in content. And also, <clears throat> And just takes longer for me to read instead of glance at a chart. If I can just talk about the chart for a second, um, one of the tips and tricks is that I just move my sticky up or down the chart to go that my eyes can follow and read very efficiently without having to track it in another way. I just use a sticky note, even on my phone sometimes. All right, uh, talking about now the piece of the finished product, looking at size and fit. I think it goes back to the inspiration piece where we are beginning to look at different knitwear and knitwear items. And often um, when we see these, these can be on someone else's body. To look at how it's fitting someone else, I always find is massively helpful. Is there a lot of ease, not a lot, not a lot of ease? How is it fitting in the way of the length of the body, the sleeves, is it a boxy fit? How is the neckline sitting, which is always a massive piece for me. So I think also having this piece of criteria because we want, I want to have my knitting within my wardrobe with things that I'm wearing and excited to pull out and wear every single time. If the sweater, for example, isn't gonna fit well, if it has way too much ease or not enough, I'm not gonna reach for it, it's gonna sit in my closet. I could look at it where it might be an interesting project to have made, but in the end, I want things that I'm gonna be able to wear and that feels good on my body and be proud of. So I think the size and fit from the things that I want in it is an absolute essential piece here. Um, understanding what yarn requirements, this goes back to our gauge swatching. We're looking at how much yarn we're going to need for a pattern. Designers often are wonderful at calculating totals of yarn quantities in recommended for their pattern um, 
their pattern design. I think when we start to go rogue and go off pattern, where we're choosing a yarn that isn't recommended in the pattern, this can go with brand. We have to do some calculation, not only with the yardage, but sometimes the weight, because um, that can be quite different too. When we look at woolen and worsted spun, for example, when we're looking at um, pairing different yarns together, like a lace weight mohair and a fingering to get a DK, how is that changing the meterage or the yardage? Especially if we're looking at modifications for what we're knitting, how are the mods going to add or take away from the meterage that we need? Essential, as, as someone that just went through the delight actually of having yarn shipped over from Norway to Canada where I did not calculate before the proper meterage. So again, this all comes from experience that I'm sharing with you. Um, another piece of criteria that we can definitely consider when choosing a pattern and I find is incredibly helpful are reviews within our knitting community that provide, I feel, feedback for perhaps the designer, but as well for us as knitters. This can be found on a variety of platforms. We can think of YouTube with other knitting podcasters where they're explaining all about that knitting journey that they took with their project, what they did maybe to improve what they think could be an easier way, a better way of doing that thing or creating a different look that is in their mind different. Um, when we also look at the reviews, another great place, as we might know, is Ravelry. That really helps us with texts from people that have shared where they're saying maybe the mods that they have done, maybe what worked well and what didn't, that can be also helpful. And I think for myself, because I'm knitting often without knitters around me, I use these different platforms to start scrolling and to gather more information if I'm stuck. This can be either a new skill or technique, but of course, if there's kind of a question with the pattern of where things are going, that can be really helpful as well. Um, another piece, which I don't think is a major piece, but just understanding abbreviations. Every designer has abbreviations just to make the knitting pattern shorter on paper that help us follow the instructions. If they wrote out every single word, every single time, obviously, these knitting patterns could be books long. So the abbreviations really help for the conciseness of the pattern, but sometimes can be a little overwhelming because different designers do use different abbreviations. So looking always at their legend, often found at the beginning of the pattern, sometimes at the very end of the pattern, and referring to that to make sure that K is actually mean, means knitting. SM might mean slip marker but it could mean something totally different in another pattern. So just being clear with what those abbreviations mean. In the end, after all of this consideration, hopefully keeping in mind, if we're following this type of process, that we're able to really start narrowing down how is this pattern and yarn going to pair well with? Is it going to be a successful, joyful knit? Is it going to be a stunner in the end? Weighing those pros and cons, again, with all the considerations that we talked about, is this something that we want to move forward with? We may have to do more calculations, but if we have the time and patience, will it be worth it to move forward and have that absolutely unique sweater in that yarn that no one else has ever done and you get to wear it on your body? These are the things that I get really excited about. You might too, we're making our own fabric, we're making our own, own garments, that could be a piece. Or are you thinking that this, after assessing all these pieces of criteria, maybe a textured knit isn't what you're after. Maybe learning a new skill or a new technique for this moment isn't something you're necessarily into. Maybe you wanna go back you just want to chill out and enjoy your knitting. You want to go back to a petite knit. 
thing that you've done. Maybe you want to knit a thing, a sweater for the second time. You want to go stocking it in the round. Again, enjoying and bringing back the happiness to our knitting. Finalizing the pattern choices, we move forward. Now we have decided, weighing everything, looking at all the criteria, being mindful, but still have the element of fun and fresh, we're finalizing our pattern choice. We can make a purchase on one of the sources that we've talked about. We have enough yarn, we've purchased it as much as we need or found it in our stash, which is even more awesome that we already have on hand. We've maybe thought out about color play and how different colors or motifs would work within that knitwear that we're gonna be casting on and we're ready to go. I really truly believe from there that your knitting experience, if you follow these steps as a simple guide on how to be a little more mindful before we need your cast on that newest, freshest design that we've seen our very favorite designer come out with and just pump the brakes for a moment, take a bit, go through all that mini analysis. We will definitely have a lot more joy in taking our time knitting and having that experience, especially as it sits on our body in the most perfect of ways. This is how I go through my knitting process. This may not be every single time. However, I feel this is a best practice. This is a very mindful way of choosing a pattern, pairing it with yarn, and coming out with something very joyful on our needles. If there's something that I missed today, going through the step-by-step guide of how to choose the perfect knitting pattern, I very much invite you to join in and comment down below. Let us know what we may have missed. Let us know maybe what I miss in my knitting process and we can all help each other. I very much thank you for being a part of this warm knitting community where we are collaborative and helpful. So thank you so much for that. If you enjoyed today's video, bringing you through how to choose the perfect knitting pattern, I invite you to like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you for those that already have. It is so meaningful. If you are finding yourself evermore, I invite you to click down below to the Ko-Fi account where you can make a donation to me and a big appreciation to people who have already done so. Thank you for being here. Really excited to hear and see what everybody's knitting up for this fall or spring, depending where you are. And until next time, wishing you great joy in your knitting. Take care.